Okay, so today we're starting a new unit, but congratulations on finishing your first exam. Looks good, happy with it. Seems like we're mostly all on the same page as far as the cardiovascular system goes, which is great because a lot of those principles we're going to be able to sort of translate into our other system. I'm glad we have a good foundation here. We had one last topic to finish up from this packet on blood. So today we are going to start out with clotting, to finish understanding how blood clots and how we do hemostasis, so keeping the same amount of blood in our body. And we're going to move into the respiratory system, starting with some respiratory anatomy that should um, link up a little bit with lab. Not totally sure where you are in the anatomy unit, but you will see the structures uh, that we're talking about today if you have not seen them already. Okay. So a little reminder of what happens before we form a real, full, mature blood clot. So we saw in the beginning of our blood clotting section that when we get a cut, the first thing that happens is we have a vascular spasm. Our blood vessel starts to constrict down, increasing resistance, which means we're decreasing flow to that area. And the next thing that happens is we start to have a platelet adhesion in response to that blood vessel damage because we've exposed this layer of the blood vessel called the subendothelium. We have a factor that's circulating around in our blood all the time, the von Willebrand factor, binding to the collagen fibers in that subendothelium, telling our platelets to adhere to this area where we have a cut. So our platelets adhere, so adhere like an adhesive, like glue, like tape, they start to stick to this cut. And they also start to secrete some uh, additional sort of messengers. So we saw here we have our platelets adhering to the area we have the collagen fibers exposed in the subendothelium. And here we can see that they are uh, secreting a couple of chemicals. So our thrombosane A2 and also ABP. That sends more signals telling them to aggregate. So now we're not just sticking to the cut, we're also sticking to the other platelets. So aggregation, aggregate means like all together. So they're forming all together this plug, which is our first sort of way of filling this gap. A platelet plug isn't super strong, so this isn't the end of the road for us, uh, but it's our first step. A thing to note at this point, so the reason we don't have this happening just like all the time, is that when those collagen fibers aren't exposed, when we don't have an injury, our healthy endothelial cells are creating, secreting these two other compounds, prostacyclin and nitric oxide. So these two messengers tell our bloodstream, tell, tell the platelets in the blood, don't clot, don't adhere right now. So this is a kind of a negative feedback, except there hasn't been a change yet. So this is a negative signal, a sort of preventative signal uh, that prevents clotting. I'm pointing that out now because uh, as we get to the end of this, we're going to see uh, a note about the effects of aspirin on clotting. And when we look at aspirin, it's going to be partially at certain doses affecting prostacyclin. I think the other one we, we talk about is how it affects thromboxane A2. So we may flip back to this image at that point. So the blood clot itself is not made up of platelets. It's going to occur around the platelet plug. What we're really trying to build is a sort of meshwork um, made of a protein called fibrin. So we say it's our dominant hemostatic defense mechanism. It's the main way we keep blood in our body. Right? So this is the main way we're going to heal this cut, keep blood from escaping. So we are going to see a lot of diagrams. Uh, but as we do that, whenever we see a picture for clotting, we're going to move kind of like from the bottom up 
And that should be kind of your priority for understanding as well. Um, Cause it's kind of a cascade of different molecules that affect different molecules. So this is gonna be the most basic, most important part of all the diagrams we're gonna see. Our goal is to make a fibrin mesh. This is our clot, the fibrin mesh. So this is gonna be a kind of stable blood clot. And the way we make this stable blood, blood clot, this fibrin mesh, is we take a molecule called fibrinogen, we turn it into loose fibrin, and then we tighten it up to create this fibrin mesh. So this is our whole real goal of all the pathways we're about to see. It's just to turn fibrinogen into fibrin, and then to stabilize that loose fibrin into a solid fibrin mesh. Oh, just a reminder, so picking our blood clot formation, what we've gone through so far. Order in your mind the steps. Hopefully, since we just spoke about this, uh, this was relatively easy. So first we have our platelets adhering, sticking to that site of injury. Next, we have them aggregating, collecting, forming the platelet plug. And then we're going to form our fibrin clot. Ultimately, that's our goal. Starting to get into these pathways. So they look a little overwhelming when you first look at them, but we're gonna break them down. So notice first, here at the bottom, we have that fibrinogen, the fibrin, the stabilized fibrin mesh at the bottom. So this is our whole goal. All the pathways that we're thinking about just have the goal of converting fibrinogen, activating it to fibrin, and then stabilizing the mesh work. Everything else we see is going to act on some part of this conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin to stabilize fibrin eventually. Other thing to note about these pictures. So as we're looking at these diagrams, you'll see that we have a lot of sort of light pink and yellow boxes and then some sort of darker yellow and red boxes. The reason for that is that the way clotting works, we have these things called clotting factors, these proteins circulating in our plasma all the time. So they're already in our blood. The reason we don't form a clot is they're inactive. So they're constantly circulating, but in order to form a clot, we're gonna to need to activate them. So when we see these lighter uh, boxes, what that's saying is this is the inactive form that we're gonna take and then activate it. So you'll see for most of these, the names are just the same, right? So here we have inactive, which is a Roman numeral 10, right? So inactive factor 10 here, 10A. So they're mostly the same. And don't, don't worry too much about knowing their exact names. I'll, I'll key you in when there's something I think is particularly important. Uh, mainly the ones with, with actual name names instead of just numbers. Okay. Uh, so that's what's going on there. We're seeing that we have these inactive clotting factors circulating in the blood and we activate them in order for them to do stuff once we have uh, an injury and actually want to form a clot. So you'll see if we talk about this first step turning fibrinogen to our loose fibrin, our activated molecule that's going to be do that, going to be doing that is something called thrombin. So thrombin turns fibrinogen into a loose fibrin meshwork. Okay. Helpfully named thrombin because thromb, we learned the other day, at least mentioned the other day that a thrombus is a technical term for a clot. 
So thrombin starts this process of making the thrombus, which is our ultimate fibrin clot. The way we get thrombin is we had inactive prothrombin that we activated using factor 10. Okay. So that's all that pathway is doing, saying we needed some thrombin to turn fibrinogen to fibrin. We already had this molecule prothrombin, which is thrombin's inactive form. We activated it for factor 10. So then the other part we want to focus on is how do we get this loose fibrin meshwork to be a stable fibrin meshwork? So how do we go from uh, messy sort of maybe flaky kind of clot i've never seen exactly what a loose fibrin meshwork looks like but not our, our fully stable blood clot we need to convert this loose meshwork into a stable meshwork and the thing that does that is this factor 13a which had an inactive form all we did was activate it and the way we activated it was using thrombus so what we might say about thrombin here and its role, right, is that thrombin is directly converting fibrinogen to fibrin to convert, create this loose meshwork. And it's indirectly, because it takes two steps, it has this other clotting factor in between, it's indirectly helping us stabilize the loose fibrinogen into the fibrin, fibrin mess. Ugh. The loose fibrin into the fibrin mesh. So directly, one step does this first part, takes two steps to do the second part. The other thing we're going to note about this image, so because they wrote intrinsic pathway so big, it makes it seem like this whole thing is the intrinsic pathway. That's not the case. What it's saying is that when we talk about intrinsic factors versus extrinsic factors that affect clotting, they're both ultimately going to go into this pathway. So both extrinsic factors and intrinsic factors narrow in and converge at this point where we see factor 10. And then it's just the thrombin converting the fibrinogen to the fibrin and the two-step process to make the loose fibrin into stable fibrin. So beyond asking you a little bit about how intrinsic and extrinsic pathways work and some of the components, I definitely will not be asking you about specific clotting factors involved with those pathways, although we will see that there are more of them. So the, the main important part is this. The most important part is part of the bottom and understanding the role of thrombin. This is also a positive feedback loop. So when we talked about negative and positive feedback way back when, uh, we saw that for homeostasis, most of our body's mechanisms for homeostasis involve negative feedback. So we see a change, and then we try to reverse that change and bring ourselves back down to a set point or a set range. Blood clotting is an example of a place we see positive feedback, which is relatively rare in the body. So this is kind of a snowball effect. As soon as we start to make this blood clot, we're going to try and speed this up and have a snowball effect until we're actually done making a clot, until we've actually fully closed over this injury. Okay. So here are those intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. So you may note that these factors are numbered with Roman numerals, but they are not in any reasonable sort of order. They numbered them based on the order that they discovered them, not the order that uh, they act in clotting, which is especially why I don't think it's important for us to remember the exact numbers for our purposes. Okay. But basically what we want to get away from this is that in our intrinsic pathway, just like with our platelet plug, what we're reacting to is that contact with the collagen and the subendothelium. Okay, so we're reacting to that cut itself, that injury itself. That's the intrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway 
is reacting to injury to the tissue surrounding the blood vessel. So that's, that's what these tissue factors are in this tissue factor complex. It's telling us that as we get a cut, we're probably also injuring tissue around the blood vessel. And that is also going to factor in, <laughs> factor, uh, into creating this clot. So the fact that our tissue is injured also sends uh, signals telling our body to make a clot. So both these pathways converge upon this uh, activation of the factor 10. Then the factor 10 activates the thrombin from its precursor molecule, the prothrombin. Thrombin first activates fibrinogen into loose fibrin. And then through this indirect action, so activating another factor, it stabilizes that mesh work as well. So inward, how do these factors come from? They're coming from the liver. Your liver has a lot of uh, different roles. So we've seen it's producing bile as we uh, remove old red blood cells from circulation and break them down. Now we see that it's going to be secreting clotting factors. Um, we'll probably discuss in lab how it also does some filtering out of toxins. It has a variety of roles. I think. We talked in ANP1 about the fact that it's a storage place for glycogen, it does gluconeogenesis. It doesn't have just one role in your body. One of the things it's doing though is helping us with clotting. So this is where those clotting factors are coming from. We're secreting them into the blood, but at this point they're inactive. So it's not like when the liver makes them, we immediately start clotting all over the place. Good, because if we did, we were forming clots all over the place all the time at random. When a clot breaks off and goes into your bloodstream, then often gets lodged somewhere else. That's like how a stroke happens, heart attacks, when those clots um, break off from the walls and then block blood vessels elsewhere in the body. So we don't want clots unless we need them to fix an injury. So if we remove those clotting factors from plasma, that's how we get what we call serum. So just that, is that fluid around it without the clotting factors. And we do have some other substances necessary for clot formation. Basically, we have some other uh, compounds that are involved in that activation process of activating our inactive clotting factors. One of them is calcium. One of them is something called platelet factor three, which is found on the outside of the platelets. All that is to say, that platelet factor three part is that those platelets forming that plug are also partially triggering this blood clot formation. Now, we don't want blood clots all the time, only want them when we need them to heal an injury. So when we don't have an injury, we have a lot of ways to inhibit, stop, to prevent our body from making clots. So anything that stops you from making a clot uh, we call an anticoagulant, anticoagulant. So coagulate is another word for like kind of coming together, forming a clot, solidifying. So they're preventing coagulation. So we have some proteins in the plasma that do this. And some of them are also found on the surface of our endothelial cells. So those cells that are lining the inside of our blood vessel. We also, um, have secretions from those endothelial cells. So both of these next two are just specific uh, compounds that would inhibit clot formation. And they're both coming from healthy cells, so uninjured cells. So we have one that inhibits the tissue factors. So the injured tissue is creating that extrinsic pathway. So the tissue factor pathway inhibitor is a mouthful but it tells you what it does, it's inhibiting that extrinsic pathway that ultimately would have led us into making a clot. Thrombomodulin, also secreted by healthy cells. Um, it acts as an anticoagulant by binding to thrombin 
We've seen that thrombin plays a really important role in forming that clot as it's the stuff that's activating the fibrin against the fibrin and it's indirectly stabilizing that meshwork. So if we disable the thrombin, we're also going to stop the clotting. It's a pretty direct route there of blocking clotting. Finally, to make a clot to stop an injury, as we have tissue growth, as we actually heal over, we do want to dissolve that blood clot. We don't want to just be full of blood clots everywhere we have ever had a cut in our lives. So we're going to dissolve the blood clot uh, using something called plasmin. So plasmin is going to be our active form. So the molecule that's going to directly break down fibrin, directly break down that clot. It has an inactive form called plasminogen. So just like we had fibrinogen as our inactive form of fibrin, plasminogen is our inactive form of plasmin. So plasmin is going to break down the fibrin clot. And we do need to activate plasminogen to turn it into plasma. So one way we can do that is with tissue plasminogen activator. That's just an example of uh, how we would activate this. So tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, is another thing that's secreted by healthy cells, of healthy endothelial cells. And actually, um, this expression of the tissue plasminogen activator is actually started off by fibrin. So fibrin itself is part of what's telling your body to make tissue plasminogen activator. So even as we're starting to make the clot, as we're starting to make the fibrin, we're also starting the pathway that's going to ultimately um, break down the clot. Now, we do have clot formation disorders. So we have diseases that prevent us from clotting appropriately. So you've probably all heard of hemophilia, but if you haven't, hemophilia is a disease where when you get a cut, right, you don't form blood clots, really. Um, you keep bleeding, so you're at high danger of potentially bleeding out if you have hemophilia. Uh, this often comes up in history classes because some rural families uh, have this uh, in their genetics. Okay. So it is a genetic disorder. And specifically, it's a genetic disorder um, that affects our specific coagulation factors or clotting factors. Um, so it's one of the ones we weren't focusing on the name of, I think it's factor eight, assuming my Roman numerals in my mind are, are correct. Um, but basically, we don't have this clotting factor, or it's not the right shape to do its job. So we are unable to appropriately activate all our other inactive factors, so we don't make the clot. There are some other reasons we might not be able to make clots appropriately. So von Willebrand's disease hits earlier in the process. So the thing with von Willebrand's disease is it reduces the levels of von Willebrand's factor, as you might guess from the name. And that was one of our compounds that was involved in forming that plasma, or sorry, that platelet plug. So that's a bit earlier in the set. But when we don't form the platelet plug appropriately, this is also going to impact forming the clot because we do these steps in order. Finally, if you have uh, vitamin deficiencies, and in this case, specifically vitamin K, um, harder to make the clotting factors. With those clotting factors, we do need all sorts of vitamins, minerals, atoms to actually build those proteins. Um, so if you don't have enough vitamin K, you might not be able to make enough of that clotting factor in the first place, which would damage your ability to form clots. So here's this note about aspirin, which is kind of neat. So you may know people, have relatives, to take a baby aspirin every day. Um, this is often something that's prescribed for heart problems. The re bless you, yeah. The reason for that is that at low doses, aspirin acts as an anticoagulant because it inhibits the formation of the thromboxane A2, which was one of the things that the platelets are secreting to form that platelet plug. So if we inhibit it, 
if we stop our platelets from grading thrombophane A2 and therefore kind of stop them from aggregating, we're going to slow down or stop clotting as that's an early step in the pathway. So at low doses, it's an anticoagulant because it stops the platelet plug from forming because it's inhibiting one of those secretions that helps us make the plug in the first place. Interestingly, though, it's dose dependent. So there's a reason it's baby aspirin specifically. At high doses, aspirin inhibits the formation of prostacyclin, which is why I was circling prostacyclin on that picture of the platelets earlier. Prostacyclin is one of our compounds secreted by healthy endothelial cells to inhibit platelet plug formation. All right, so if we have prostacyclin being secreted by healthy cells, it's going to stop clots from spreading out to the sides towards healthy tissue. Um, if we take too much aspirin and we're inhibiting that compound from being expressed, this means that those platelet plugs actually can spread a lot more to the side, so it will make clotting worse if clotting is the thing you're trying to avoid. At low doses, stop clotting, but at high doses, um, we increase the risk of clotting. And now we're going to move into the respiratory system. So we're going to start out a big overview of respiration. So there are some sort of tricky topics right off the bat. Not tricky necessarily to conceptually understand, but just some, some terms that we're going to want to be very careful that we understand and don't mix up. So when we talk about respiration, we're overall talking about the process of gas exchange. So by gas exchange, we really mean we're, we're thinking about oxygen, we're thinking about carbon dioxide. We have already seen a type of respiration, cellular respiration, right? So in cellular respiration, what we focused on before was that we were creating ATP, which is true. But in order to do that, we took oxygen into the cell and then we released carbon dioxide as a byproduct. So if we are thinking about respiration as a big picture concept, we do include cellular respiration in that picture. So cellular respiration, that uh, formation of ATP, because we take in oxygen and give out uh, carbon dioxide, this counts as internal respiration. So internal, like within the cell, basically, is what we want to say here. So the reason I say that's tricky is if you just read that phrase without thinking about it or without knowing what it means, you might think internal inside the body. But when we say internal respiration, we mean on a way, way, way more micro scale. We're talking about inside the cell with our cellular respiration. And specifically, it happens during the oxidative phosphorylation step. So that was that last step inside the mitochondria with the electron transport chain, that building of the hydrogen gradient across the membrane, releasing it using oxygen as our final electron acceptor. And earlier in the process, we think that it rid of CO2. So that's internal respiration. So we're not really going to be talking about that in this unit because we've already talked about this in the context of metabolism. So what we're really gonna be focusing on in this unit, pretty much everything we talk about is going to be part of external respiration. So when we talk about external respiration, we're talking about how we're getting gases from our external environment into our body, into our lungs, how we're moving them from the lungs to the blood, and even how we're moving them between blood and body tissue. So the internal was very nitty gritty inside the cell having to do with metabolism. External is the whole pathway we'll be talking about in this unit. So if you think about the word respiration in a sort of normal English vocabulary sense, what you're probably thinking about is technically termed pulmonary ventilation. 
So ventilation, like opening a window, pulmonary ventilation is the physical act of pulling that air in. So inhalation and exhalation, that's our pulmonary ventilation part. So that's where we'll be starting off in this unit. And then as we move forward, we will talk about how gases are going to diffuse across our membranes and get from the lungs into the blood. And then we will also talk more about our uh, hemoglobin. We'll talk a, a fair bit about how oxygen jumps onto those heme groups, how it moves that oxygen around the body, and how we get rid of the carbon dioxide. And we'll also take a little bit of a look again at how that gets exchanged between the blood and the tissue. So it's not until we get deep into the cell, into the mitochondria, that it would have been internal respiration. So questions uh, about these terms. We'll just make sure not to forget what we're talking about. So as we go through these processes. So we're going to start by talking about the anatomy of the respiratory system. And the reason for that is we're going to be paying attention to where in the respiratory system we actually have gas exchange. We'll see that some parts of the respiratory system are going to have kind of dead air sitting there that isn't actually exchanging gases with our blood. Um, and we're also going to be thinking about some of these uh, anatomical features as influencing our pressure differences which is going to influence the movement of air, which will be one of our next topics, so ventilation part. So we can divide basic anatomy into the upper airways, the respiratory tract, and then other structures in the thoracic cavity. So we'll go through each of those. So upper airways, which is our air passages in the head and neck. We know their familiar name, nose, so our nasal cavities, our mouth, so our oral cavity, and our pharynx, so our throat. And we maybe talked in lab already. Sorry, I should look at the schedule and how we're paired up. But we have our nose going into the nasopharynx, the mouth going into the oropharynx, and we had the laryngopharynx, right where about our voice box is, our Adam's apple. That's all part of our upper airways. And these are mainly like resonating chambers for the voice. Uh, as well as ways we can suck air in. So our focus for lecture is going to be on the respiratory tract rather than the upper airways. We're going to focus on the functional differences. We're going to have two regions that we think about called the conducting zone and the respiratory zone. They're both part of the respiratory tract. The tract is just like a pathway. So you have to go through both of these zones to get air all the way down into the lung. In the conducting zone, we're going to see these are passageways that are really just for physically moving the air. And it's not until we get to the respiratory zone that we're going to see the gas exchange across membranes. So that's going to be our functional difference. So here we see all the pieces that we might name within these zones. All right, so here we're starting at the larynx, so the right out where your voice box is. Moving down into the trachea, which is the, the tube has cartilage rings around it. We're going to see these cartilage rings continue in our primary bronchi. So we have one go to the right and one go to the left, and right? we have a split of the trachea. Then it splits again into our secondary bronchi, so now we have multiple in each lung. Tertiary bronchi, smaller bronchi, all of these have cartilage. And then we have two pieces of the conducting zone still, where we're not going to have cartilage, our bronchioles and our terminal bronchioles. Now the purpose of the cartilage is basically to hold these airways open and to stop them from collapsing. We're going to see that we're adjusting the pressure a lot in order to create inhalation and exhalation. Um, so it's important that as we're messing with these pressures, we're not just like constantly collapsing these tubes because it would be hard to open all of them again. So that's what the cartilage is doing. It's creating this sort of uh, firm skeleton, but not bone. 
holding these pathways open. Um, in the trachea, kind of need their C shape because your esophagus, so like your pathway where food goes, is right behind it, and we need room for food to move as well. And then the cartilage just slightly changes shape as our passageways get smaller and smaller. The other things we're going to be thinking about in a second with the conducting zone are the cilia and goblet cells. For those of you you won't be talking about in lab, these are going to lead to some of our uh, interesting functions about how we uh, clear pathogens and particles from our airways. Okay. And we can see that we have smooth muscle throughout the conducting zone here and into a bit of the respiratory zone as well. So we're going to be able to change the size of these pathways a little bit, which means we're going to be able to change their resistance. And we know that that's going to be related to flow and pressure in the respiratory uh, unit. We're going to be thinking about flow of air, but it's going to work by the same physical principles as our blood flow did uh, in our previous unit. Our conducting zone begins with our larynx. So the larynx is uh, basically your voice box. Starts with something called the glottis, which is an opening. There's a flap over the opening, your epiglottis. Anytime you see that beginning epi, that means near, basically. So the epiglottis is near the glottis. And this closes over the larynx so that when you swallow food, you don't end up with like macaroni in your lungs. Wouldn't be good. Okay. So that's what's going on with the larynx. This is going to be our split between our alimentary tract, that's our food, and our respiratory tract, specifically just for our air going into the lungs. So that's the first part of our conducting zone. Then next comes our trachea. So that's just a single tube with these C shaped cartilage bands keeping it open. Then we have our smaller branches in the conducting zone. So we have our main bronchi. We have primary bronchi, I should say, one to the right lung and one to the left lung. These split into secondary bronchi, one of which is gonna go to each of the lobes of the lung. So your right lung has three lobes. Your left lung only has two lobes because we have to make space for the heart. So there would be three secondary bronchi on the right side, but only two on the left side. You'll see them in lab if you have not yet. After that, the branching goes a little wild and crazy. There are 20 to 23 rounds of branching for your tertiary bronchi, so we don't really care about the exact numbers for those. And that brings us to our bronchioles and terminal bronchioles. They're really small, just like our arterioles were small, right? So now we're down to less than a millimeter in diameter. Terminal bronchioles are quite, quite small. Okay. You'll note that these no longer have cartilage, but they are still part of our conducting zone. And because they don't have cartilage, at this point, we would be able to collapse the bronchioles and the terminal bronchioles. They are potentially at risk of collapse. So the conducting zone has some important roles. One is to bring air into your thorax, right? So the air has to travel through these passageways. And we can fit about 150 milliliters of air in the conducting zone. So this means that in the future, when we start to talk about mixing of gas, just like when we were thinking about blood, we had arterial blood with lots of oxygen in it, and deoxygenated blood in the veins, we're actually going to think about a similar concept with air. So like fresh air that you breathe in that has lots of oxygen in it, and then the air that you breathe out having lots of carbon dioxide. We are going to be thinking about how those mix together and exactly what that process looks like, amounts of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, we're going to have to factor in that the air in the conducting zone is not going to have uh, diffusion happening across the walls of the conducting zone. We're not getting gases into 
uh, our body there. We're just physically holding them in that space. So we think of them as dead space or dead air. Another role of the conducting zone is to warm air. We want our air to be at around body temperature for the, the processes that are happening in the lungs. Your lungs are fragile. The walls of our alveoli, so some of our respiratory structures are quite thin, delicate. Um, we want to make a nice environment for them. So we're going to increase the air temperature, warm stuff up. That happens in the conducting zone. We're also going to humidify the air. So we're going to moisturize it, add water to it, which is going to change a couple of uh, its properties as well. We want nice, moist, warm air in the lungs. And the conducting zone gives us that. So we're going to look at the epithelium, so the lining cells of the conducting zone. So what we've zoomed in on here, like one wall of part of our conducting zone. So our other wall would be like here. We'd have the same stuff mirrored on the opposite side. Okay. And then we've zoomed in even more to look at the types of cells we have in the walls of the conducting zone. So the conducting zone, and in general, your respiratory tract is moist. We have these cells called goblet cells that are secreting mucus onto the mm -hmm. surface of our epithelial cells, so onto the surface of this lining. Now, mucus is cypress in some places in that it's kind of sticky. It can trap particles, including pathogens, as they come in through our airways. But if we have too much mucus, if we have collections of mucus, if we're not clearing our mucus, then we're keeping those trapped particles and pathogens in the body, in the mucus, in our respiratory tract, which can lead to infection if they start to uh, replicate and spread. We don't want the mucus to collect though, so we also have ciliated cells. So cilia are these little hairs on the ends of cells. Right. So our ciliated cells are these uh, purple ones. What the cilia do, they wiggle and they wiggle up. So they're taking the mucus and they're pushing it up and up and up and up through the tract. So we refer to this as the mucus escalator, which sounds disgusting, but I'm kind of in love with it. So we're like trapping particles and pathogens in the mucus. And then we're pushing the mucus up towards your mouth with the cilia. So this is how we're getting rid of mucus. And then you could spit it out, squeeze it out, blow your nose, uh, expel it through parts of your upper airways once we get uh, that mucus up to the top. So you may also know people uh, who have smoker's cough. One of the reasons that happens is that uh, smoke paralyzes the cilia so they can't move like this, so we're damaging this escalator part of the mucus escalator. So then the only way we can get the mucus out, the way we clear it, is through sending bursts of pressure. So through a cough, to kind of send a fire hose through that mucus and get it out. So that's part of what's happening there. We're getting irritation because we're not moving the mucus and particles out of our lungs the way we normally would. Here we see a histological side. So our ciliated cells are these ones lining the lumen. So remember the lumen is the hollow inside part of a tube in our body. So in this case, it's the lumen of the trachea, so the space where the air would be. So those are our ciliated cells. And our goblet cells can also be thought of as glands because glands secrete stuff. Um, so our goblet cells, uh, if we were matching them to our slide, they would be kind of here and sending mucus into the gaps. But I suspect that this gland here below is involved with the goblet cells as well, because they would look histologically something like that. Maybe we just cut through one at a weird angle. So that was all in the conducting zone. So you'll notice that now that we are down into the respiratory zone, we don't have goblet cells anymore. That's what those zeros mean. 
we do have a couple cilia in what we're going to term our respiratory bronchioles, but not once we get into our alveolar sacs, which is where we're really, really going to focus on the gas exchange. We can also see that uh, our smooth muscle is going to end once we're in our alveolar sacs as well. So the job of the respiratory zone is to ex physically exchange the gases. So the specializations that we're going to see in this region, we're going to see really thin linings. We're, we're going to see thin membranes. We're going to see uh, small layers of cells so that oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse across these barriers easily. Uh, and we're also going to see structures that increase surface area. So the more space you have, the more surface you have for gas exchange, the more gas exchange you can do. So that's why when we get towards the tippy tippy ends of our respiratory zone, we have these alveolar sacs, which are these grape-like cluster, clusters. So one of these bubbles is called an alveolus, plural alveoli. So what these are doing is creating an increased surface area so that we can do a lot more respiration, a lot more gas exchange here. So formally, the parts of our respiratory zone are the respiratory bronchioles, which are going to begin to be covered with alveoli. So here we have our alveolar ducts, our alveoli, and our alveolar sacs. So our line of demarcation, our separation between the respiratory zone and the uh, conducting zone was when we ended the conducting zone. Those were our terminal bronchioles. It's a little tricky because they're not actually the last thing. They're just the last part of the conducting zone. Because our respiratory bronchioles are going to follow the terminal bronchioles. So that's another place where our vocabulary, our terms for these structures, is a little tricky unless you know specifically what they mean. We're going to just take a closer peek at that arrangement. So here's our terminal bronchial. So that was still part of the conducting zone. It's got dead air in it, so it's not doing gas exchange. So we're going to draw a line like here or something where it becomes the respiratory bronchial. So once we hit the respiratory bronchial, we are going to begin gas exchange across the walls of these cells. As we move towards these grape-like clusters at the end, we're gonna to start to call this a duct. So here's our alveolar duct. So it's still kind of a tube, but we can see some alveoli, some of these bubbles on it as well. And then when we're in the sac, we're gonna see that it's completely surrounded by these alveoli, by these little bubbles that are gonna increase our surface area and therefore increase our ability to do gas exchange. So we'll pick up with the alveoli on Friday. Um, hopefully this place gets us started. We have a solid grasp on some of these terms that we're gonna be talking about as we think about the physiology.